convidamos para compor a mesa de honra o reitor da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, professor Jaime Arturo Ramírez. Com a palavra, o reitor da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, professor Jaime Arturo Ramírez, para a abertura desta solenidade. Bom dia a todas e a todos. Bom dia, gente. É uma satisfação poder vir à Faculdade de Ciências Econômicas, à FACE, para dar continuidade a esse ciclo de conferências da UFMG, 90 anos, são inúmeras as atividades que serão desenvolvidas ao longo do ano até o final de 2017, ano em que a UFMG completa 90 anos. E hoje temos a satisfação de vir aqui para, é, dentro da temática de desafios contemporâneos, discutir a atualidade de O Capital a propósito dos 150 anos da obra. É, eu queria inicialmente agradecer na pessoa da professora, é, a diretora da Faculdade de Ciências Econômicas, que gentilmente nos cedeu o espaço para que pudéssemos aqui realizar essa atividade e se integra na atividade dos 90 anos. Muito obrigado. É, cumprimentar todos os docentes, todos os colegas técnicos administrativos, todos os discentes, não apenas da faculdade, mas também de toda a universidade e todas as pessoas da sociedade que aqui estejam presentes. É uma grande satisfação para o FMG acolhê-los. É, eu vou convidar o professor Hugo Araújo da Gama Cerqueira, professor do Departamento de Ciências Econômicas, para se juntar à minha mesa, que ele vai fazer a saudação e a apresentação do nosso convidado. Professor Hugo, por favor. Bom dia a todos. Satisfação imensa ver tanta gente aqui reunida para essa atividade. Ah, e aquilo que nos traz aqui é, na verdade, a comemoração de uma série de efemérides, né, de aniversários, a começar pelo aniversário de 90 anos da nossa universidade, mas eu queria também tomar a liberdade de incluir aqui, entre as homenagens, uh, mencionar os 50 anos que o CDPLAR, o Centro de Desenvolvimento e Planejamento Regional da UFMG, uh, estão completando nesse ano. Uh, e é também momento de comemorarmos os 150 anos da publicação do primeiro livro de O Capital. Né? Essa que é a obra magna uh, de Karl Marx. Né? E se não, for, uh, não fosse ainda necessário, nós vamos estar uh, comemorando no próximo ano também os 200 anos de nascimento do filósofo, economista, pensador alemão Karl Marx. Portanto, temos uma série de razões festivas para nos reunirmos aqui. Né? Ah, mas esta é uma atividade que é parte de um seminário cujo título é o FMG 90 Anos, Desafios Contemporâneos. Né? Em que medida falar de Marx? Em que medida falar de um livro que, afinal, foi publicado há século e meio, né? constitui parte dos desafios contemporâneos? Uh, para nos falar sobre isso, uh, nós convidamos aquele que é certamente um dos uh, mais argutos e uh, intérpretes da obra de Marx na contemporaneidade, um profundo conhecedor dessa obra. Né? Uh, obra essa que tem a característica peculiar de ter sido apenas publicada em parte, né? E Michael Heinrich, o nosso convidado uh, de hoje, né, é não apenas um conhecedor daquilo que está disponível, daquilo que está publicado uh, de Karl Marx, mas também de uma série de textos que seguem até hoje inéditos, não publicados, né, uh, mas agora disponíveis para pesquisa, né, organizados é, em um arquivo europeu, 
é, e que vão compor aquilo que é um dos projetos editoriais mais ousados uh, atualmente, que é o projeto da Mega, Mega 2, a Marx, Engels, Gesamt aus Gabe, né, a publicação das obras completas de Marx e Engels, um projeto que já tomou algumas décadas e ainda vai se prolongar por outras tantas, porque há muito ainda a conhecer a respeito daquilo que o pensador alemão escreveu e não chegou a publicar. Né. Heinz conhece a fundo esses documentos, ele participa, Desse, proje desse projeto editorial. Né? Uh, além disso, ele é editor de uma importante revista de ciências sociais, Procla, né, uma revista alemã, e é autor de inúmeros artigos e de livros muito importantes. Eu tomaria liberdade para citar apenas dois. Né? Uh, o primeiro, A Ciência do Valor, que é a sua obra talvez mais importante, né? uh, que é um texto de exegese, de interpretação do capital né? e é uma introdução à crítica da economia política, que é uma espécie assim, de best-seller da área, né? um livro que já vendeu várias edições e, e que é muito bem sucedido em nos apresentar de uma maneira sintética o conteúdo das milhares de páginas que ocupam os três tomos, os três volumes uh, do capital. Né? Uh, portanto, nós estamos... Uh, tendo a satisfação hoje de contar aqui com uma pessoa altamente qualificada para nos mostrar em que medida a obra do Marx continua sendo uma obra esclarecedora dos problemas da contemporaneidade. Eu não vou pretender aqui fazer, uh, às vezes, né, o trabalho daquilo que Michael vai, o Michael vai, vai nos, nos explicar, mas eu queria apenas mencionar que na UFMG há uma longa tradição também de estudos sobre Marx, Nessa faculdade, na Faculdade de Filosofia, na FAI, no IGC, na Arquitetura, em outras unidades, vejo aqui rostos de pessoas que vieram de diferentes unidades da, da, da UFMG, isso para nós é uma satisfação. Não vou mencionar o nome de nenhum estudioso especial para, para não me esquecer de pessoas que são importantes. Né? Constituíram aqui uma certa tradição de reflexão sobre a obra do Marx. Né? E dizer que é, Marx é um autor incontornável, né, e insuperável, né? incontornável no sentido de que não dá para pensar as ciências sociais, né, qualquer ramo das ciências sociais, sem passar pela obra de Marx. Né? Insuperável no sentido de que daquele, daquilo que Sartre, o filósofo francês, disse uma vez, né? uh, a obra de Marx é insuperável porque ela é uma obra que enfrenta os problemas do nosso tempo. Né? Marx é insuperável não tanto pelas respostas que ele possa ter oferecido a esses problemas, mas pelo fato de que os problemas que motivaram sua obra continuam ser, a ser problemas contemporâneos. Né? A compreensão, a necessidade da compreensão do capitalismo, da sua natureza essencial e as possibilidades de constituir uma sociedade mais humana, uma sociedade onde os homens e as mulheres possam se emancipar. Bom, mas é isso que eu queria dizer de pronto. Quero convidar Maico, Micael para vir à mesa, por favor. Vou retornar a palavra ao reitor. Antes de passar a palavra ao nosso convidado, eu queria pedir permissão aos nossos presentes para dirigir algumas palavras a ele em inglês. Ele vai fazer a palestra em inglês e aqueles que desejarem a microfones na entrada haverá tradução simultânea. Tá? Michael, welcome to our institution. It's a real privilege for us to welcome you and on behalf of our institution, I thank you for traveling from your country to stay for a couple of weeks in Brazil and to share your critical view on the immense work of Karl Marx. And from now on, I pass the microphone to you and I'm sure that our audience will have a very important and profound discussion on the work of Karl Marx. Thank you again for making this event possible. Uh, 
So thank you very much for the invitation and for the possibility to be uh, present at this um, celebration of the 90th uh, anniversary of the university. I'm very happy um, to be here. Um, today I will speak about uh, Marx Capital and uh, the actuality of Marx Capital. We in this year, we have not only the 90th uh, anniversary of the university, we also have the 150th anniversary of, uh, of the first volume of Capital. It appeared in the year 1867. And this 150 years um, pose, of course, at first the question how actual, how up-to-date such a book can be. And there are many critics who uh, say, okay, maybe for 19th century it was an interesting book, but in the meantime, the economy, the society has changed so much that we cannot learn very much from capital. But such a critic also um, poses the question, what is the object, the scientific object of Marx capital? Was it the British capitalism in the mid of 19th century? If this would be the case, then indeed capital would be outdated. It would all only be a, a kind of historic relic. But Marx, in his preface to the uh, 1867 edition stated that the, the examples he took from England should only illustrate his theoretical development. And that the object of capital is not the development of capitalism, the higher or lower stage of capitalism, it is the laws which are behind this development. In the manuscript for Book 3 of Capital, written two years before this uh, preface, Marx used the very nice, in, in my sense, a very nice expression to characterize his own project. <coughs> he said that he wanted to present in Capital the mode, the, uh, the capitalist mode of production in its ideal average. In its ideal average. What does this mean, ideal average? It is not an empirical average. Marx didn't have the idea just to compare some advanced uh, capitalist countries of his time, like England, France, Germany, and to say what do they have in common that is capitalism. This would be an empirical average. No. What he wanted to present was an ideal average. What belongs necessarily to capitalism? What are the basic structures? What are the basic dynamics? And if we still live in capitalism today, and if Marx succeeded, at least to a certain degree, to analyze this ideal average, then capital is still important today. So, because of the rather high level of abstraction that Marx just didn't give a, a picture of a contemporary Britain, but that he tries to give a picture from this ideal average, therefore, capital is still useful today. But this nice advantage side of capital also has a backside. When it is on such a high level of abstraction, then this means it cannot 
explain all the empirical details of today. The empirical um, appearance of capital, of course, changed during 150 years, and also today, capitalism in Latin America is not the same than capitalism in Western Europe or in Northern America. To catch all these empirical uh, differences and the ep empirical appearances, we need more than Marx capital. We need our own investigation and every generation needs its own investigation. But what I wanted to, to show today is that in Marx Capital, we can find at least the basic instruments in order to produce such uh, an investigation. So I try to not just to, uh, to memorize the, the content of Capital or of the uh, first volume, this would be impossible just in one hour, but to give some features how Marx analyzed this ideal average. The first hint to his uh, specific approach we can find already in the subtitle of Capital. The subtitle is Critique of Political Economy. Political economy in 19th century was more or less similar to what nowadays is called economics. Maybe it was a little bit broader than economics today. It was not so model-oriented like it is today, but it uh, included all the sciences about economy and the state. And when Marx uh, uses the subtitle Critique of Political Economy, he indicates that he didn't want only to criticize some authors or some theories. No, he wanted to criticize a whole science, the science of political economy. And in which way he did this? To criticize a science as a science means not only to criticize the results as insufficient, but also to criticize the basic categories or the kind of questions which were put by this science. A nice example for this critic of a whole science, we can already find in the first chapter of the first volume. In this first chapter, Marx deals with the connection between value, economic value, exchange value, and labor. And Marx admits that the classical school of Adam Smith and David Ricardo already discovered that the content of value is human labor. So he ex accepted a certain result. But what was his critique to the classical school, and we can also generalize to the whole science of political economy, his critique was that he said they didn't ask why labor takes the form of value and why the labor time spent takes the form of the magnitude of value. So what Marx was criticizing was not mainly the result of the labor theory of value of the classical school. He criticized a missing question. So he, by this it becomes clear he criticized the kind of approach. And why this question this missing question, why labor takes the form of value, why this question is so crucial? Because by missing this question, the difference between 
natural forms or forms which we can find in any society and special social forms, historical forms, are confused. Adam Smith, for example, sees the difference between humans and animals in commodity production. The humans produce commodities, exchange commodities. No animal ever were seen exchanging something. Maybe they, some dogs fight for some bones, but you never saw dogs exchanging one big bone against two small bones. This for Marx, not for Marx, for, for Adam Smith, is a characteristic feature of humans. So, commodity production, commodity exchange, reaches a kind of natural form. Whenever we have humans, we, it seems to have uh, commodity production. Marx, in contrast, sees commodity production as a special historical and uh, a social form of production, and in, in human history also other forms are found. By not putting the question why labor takes the form of value, it is out of view that value, economic value, value production is not natural, but it is a social form. And this has political consequences. When you want to change society, you of course, can only change something which is in this, uh, produced by this society, which is a social form of the society. When something is a kind of natural form that humans need oxygen, we cannot change. But, and that humans need food to survive, that they have to produce food to survive, you cannot change. But that this food production and tool production, machine production, takes the form of commodity production, this you can change. And in so far, the, the distinction between what is a kind of natural, inevitable form and what is a socially produced form has an enormous political impact. that this um, distinction between natural and social form was not caught by classical political economy, was not an individual mistake. It was not the individual shortcoming of Adam Smith or of David Ricardo. Marx tries to show that commodity production and capitalist production is the highest form of uh, commodity production that commodity production includes a certain kind of fetishism. Fetishism in Marx's sense, not in the maybe nowadays sense oriented to Sigmund Freud as an obsession, but in the 19th century uh, sense where fetishism aimed to some so-called primitive uh, religions, primitive relief beliefs, where a produced product of wood or of leather was uh, seen as uh, something which has magic power and to which we have submit. Fetishism in this case, Marx also sees in the capitalist commodity production. The commodities are our product, but they became autonomous the human producers are not related directly, they are only related by the commodities. I, took, I take the commodity I produce to the market and there this commodity must uh, reach an exchange relation to another commodity. And this exchange relation is the important thing and not I as a producer or the other guy as a producer. So, we are, in commodity production, we are submitted to 
the, the rule to the domination of our own products. And so the very enlightened society in 19th century in, in Western uh, uh, countries which uh, thought they are, have such a big progress to uh, compared with so-called primitive societies, this seemingly enlightened society also suffers by a certain kind of fetishism, a fetishism which to the members of, of uh, capitalist societies seems to be natural. So in some respect, in, in modern terms, we can say Marx's critique of political economy, the critique of a whole science, leads to a critique, to an epistemological critic of knowledge in modern societies. This fetishism Marx analyzed is not a kind of ideology. It is not a kind of manipulation. Marx used the term uh, objective form of thought. It is an objective form of thought which is produced by the social structure of commodity production. And we have to work to overcome this uh, objective form of thought. So the critique of political economy, the critique of science, leads to an epistemological critique of modern knowledge. There is another feature of Marx's analysis I wanted uh, to stress. Also, Marx, already in the preface of Capital Volume 1 from 1867, mentions this. In this preface, he writes, the figures of uh, the capitalist and the landowner looks not very nice in my presentation. But the real object are not the persons. These persons are only personifications of economic categories. They are limited to these surroundings produced by economic structure. And this is very important to understand the, the whole uh, order of categories, the whole approach Marx is doing, and it is a fundamental difference to the approach of modern, especially neoclassical economics. Neoclassical economics, and also a big part of modern sociology, starts with what nowadays is called methodological individualism. They think they can start with the individual, with the attributes, the feature of an individual, with the interests of the individual, and by the interaction of individuals, society is produced. Marx argues the other way around. He sees the individuals in capitalist society as personification of economic conditions of economic relations, economic categories. This has consequences for his mode of presentation. When you read Capital, or when you open Capital, the first volume, you will see the title of the first chapter is The Commodity. And you can learn a lot about the form determinants of the commodity. The commodity is a special form of the labor product. It has use value, exchange value. This uh, double character depends on the double character of uh, commodity producing labor and so on. What is not an object in chapter one of capital is the commodity owner, the commodity producer. Only in chapter 2, with the title The Exchange Process, you will find the commodity owner. 
the first sentence of this uh, chapter two, very famous formulation is, the commodities cannot go to the market by themselves. Therefore, we have to look to the owners of the commodities. So, only in chapter two, the persons and the actions of the persons are analyzed. And the actions are analyzed in the framework of the form determination which was developed already in chapter one. So what was in, in the preface only an abstract statement, the persons are persons as uh, are personifications of economic um, conditions, you see in practice when you compare chapter one and chapter two of capital. And this has enormous consequences which often are mistaken. For example, money plays a, an important role in chapter one and in chapter two. And some readers may think, oh, Marx is a bad author. In chapter two, he repeats what he already said in chapter one. But this is wrong. Chapter one deals with the necessity of the money form, that value needs an independent general form. Chapter 2 deals with money and it shows that money is the necessary outcome of the action of persons who act under the, these form determinations of the commodity. So there is no repetition. The, the subject uh, regarding money in chapter 1 is money form in chapter two is money. And this structure you will see also in, in other um, parts. For example, in chapter four, first the category of capital is developed and after this is done, Marx comes to the capitalist. And how he explains capitalist, not as an owner, the ownership is uh, of secondary importance. What is a capitalist? A capitalist is a person who takes the objective aim of capital, valorization, as his or her subjective aim. So what is a capitalist depends on capital and not on some subjective uh, features like greediness or so. And this has important political consequences like fetishism and the confusion of natural and social forms also had um, important political uh, um, impacts, as I mentioned before. When the persons follow the form determinations of the capitalist commodity production, then critique the political critique of uh, capitalists' uh, mode of production cannot be a critique of capitalists. It must be a critique of capitalism. So Marx's critique is not a critique of persons, it is a critique of structures. And when you want to change something fundamentally, it is not at all enough to change persons instead of, let us say, private owners, you have a, a state owner or a collective owner. No, you must change the structure, the logic of capitalist production, no matter who is the owner. Also, in so far, what maybe at the beginning it sounds a little bit uh, abstract, scientific, person, personification, you see it has a very direct political implication. This also holds for other contents of um, Marx analysis. When you ask someone, okay, what is the concrete um, uh, content of volume one, then maybe uh, you will hear the answer, 
Marx describes the exploitation of the workers, Marx describes accumulation and crisis. All this is correct. Exploitation, accumulation, crisis are important um, features. Also, class rule is an important content of capital. But exploitation and class rule exist in every class society. It exists in the ancient Greek slaveholders society. It exists in the medieval society uh, of, of uh, feudal servitude. And ex it exists in the modern capitalist society. The interesting point is not that exploitation and class rule exist. The interesting point is the special form of exploitation and class rule in modern capitalist society. What is the specificity of modern societies, of post-feudal societies? The specificity is that you have no longer, at least as a rule, no longer personal dependence, like a slave was owned by a, by a special person and the slave was the, the property of this person. In a capitalist society, in, in modern times, usually people are legally free and equal citizens. We know that capitalism also used slavery in the United States. Slavery was only abolished, for example, in uh, the mid of 19th century. So s capitalism can use slavery, but capitalism is not dependent on slavery. Capitalism can work, can survive without slavery, and this causes the question, how exploitation and class rule is possible when we have a society of free and equal citizens. A liberal thinker may answer, when the persons are free and equal, this already proves that there can be no exploitation, that there can be no class rule. We have a free society, and the liberals think that a market society, a capitalist society, is already a free society. Marx in Capital, in, in contrast, tries to show that the, the personal dependence, the personal rule, is substituted by an unpersonal anonymous rule. What does this mean? Let us look to his um, analysis of exploitation. The worker is free and equal. He uh, makes a contract with uh, the capitalist and he sells a commodity. When the commodity is sold for its value, how exploitation should be possible. Marx insists that uh, the worker is not selling labor. Labor is not at all a, a commodity. It is a certain process. The laborer sells its labor power, his or her labor power. And labor power is a very special commodity, not a kind of natural commodity, it is a commodity which has a historical, uh, um, which has a certain history, which is produced in history. In order to sell labor power as a commodity, you must have, on the one hand, a free worker, free in the legal sense, but this worker also must be free in a very material sense, free from any means of uh, consumption and means of production, so that this free worker, just by the conditions, by the pressure of the conditions, is forced to sell the only what he or she has, the labor power. 
So even the, the free citizen, laborer, is forced in exploitation, is forced to submit to capital. Not by, by personal dependence, but by the pressure of condition. But this, on the other hand, also counts for the capitalists. The capitalists, in Marx's view, are the ruling class. But also, as a ruling class, they are submitted to impersonal domination. The capitalists themselves are ruled by the force of competition. They have to maximize profit, not because they are greedy, maybe this is an additional feature, maybe you have a lot of capitalists who are greedy, but this is not the main point. Even if someone is not at all greedy, studied a lot of Marx or whatever, when he or she wants to survive as a capitalist, he or she has to maximize profits. Otherwise, uh, he or she will, um, will be destroyed in competition. So, we have a ruling class which is not free in their ruling action. They have also to follow a certain logic of the system but the logic of the system will bring advantage to this class. When the capitalist production process is successful, the worker come out of this process exactly like they went in. They are the double free uh, laborer who is politically free and uh, materially um, has the necessity to sell the labor power and the capitalist come out of the process with all the money which makes him able to buy the labor power. So, when you want to, to change something in, uh, in capitalist society, you have not just to see, oh, it's exploitation, it is class rule, you have to see this specificity of exploitation and class rule under modern conditions. In sum, we can say that um, capital, provides, capital is much, much more than an economic work in the modern sense. Capital gives us a whole theory of societies, of modern societies, of modern epistemology, of modern uh, a kind of thought, of recognition, and it gives us a whole theory of modern forms of domination. This analytical approach makes capital so important for nowadays analysis, as I stated um, at the beginning. This was the celebrational part of my lecture. But I'm, maybe you will call me dogmatic. I'm very dogmatic um, pupil of Marx. And I read in the preface of 1867, every judgment of scientific critique is welcome. An important sentence at the end of the preface. You can find it there. Okay. He wants scientific critique. He can have scientific critique. The first critique we have to do is that in 67, only the first volume appeared. And many persons who say, I read Marx Capital, when you ask them, they mean... I read the first volume of Capital. This is not only incomplete reading, it is misleading reading. The three volumes of Capital form an inseparate unity. You can see this already in the titles. 
The, the first volume has the title Production Process, Production Process of Capital. The second volume, The Circulation Process of um, Capital. The third volume, The Total Process of Capital. And of course, these are not independent parts. These are only divisions made for the analysis in order to develop the categories, in order to, to grasp the object Marx wants to present, the capitalist mode of production. You need all the three volumes. If you restrict yourself to volume one, then maybe you will confuse value, which is a big theme in vol volume one, with market price, which is an issue in volume three. You will confuse surplus value, big issue in volume one, with profit. And you totally miss in volume one interest, banking, shareholder capital. All this is only, uh, uh, these are points of volume three. So this is important that you have to see not only what Marx published, volume one, you also have to see what Marx published, what Marx not published, and what was published by his very close friend and companion, Frederick Engels, after Marx's death. We can be very thankful to Frederick Engels that he put his own research activities aside after Marx's death, and he said, okay, the years I, I have, and he also was in his 60s when, when Marx died, I devote to, for the publication of volume two and volume three of Capital. So we have really to be thankful to Engels, but also we have to be critical to Engels. Engels published not just what he found, some drafts. He tried to make these drafts more readable, more clear for the reader. And this he did without a big scientific apparatus. He had one secretary, not very able, the guide. He could just uh, dictate him from the Marx manuscript. But all the, the scientific work of addition, Marx has, uh, Engels had to do by himself. What we had for more than 100 years as uh, volume two and three was an editing done by Frederick Engels and by the side also, the most widespread edition of volume one is also edited by Engels. It is not the original volume one published by Marx. Now, I, I didn't uh, understand Portuguese, but um, when Hugo uh, did the introduction, I heard mega Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe. So he mentioned something about this. It is a big new edition, started in the year 1975. And when it will be completed, in 20 years, I suppose, it will include 114 volumes. Everything, every draft, every letter, every note of Marx and Engels is included. Fortunately, the second part of this mega, which has all the publications of Capital, all the drafts for Capital, is already completed. And so now we are able to compare Marx's original manuscript with the editions of Engels. And there we found out, it was a big discussion in, in the 90s in which I also took part, we found out that there are some important differences in the publication, in the editing of Engels and the manuscripts. It is not a bad will of Engels. It is not a, a kind of manipulation. But Engels tried to, things, to make things more clear. And so where Marx 
had an open problem, Engels formulated sometimes a solution. And we don't know if this solution would have been Marx's solution. So for a scientific um, treatment of capital nowadays, especially regarding volume two and volume three, mega is very useful. And I will give you an example why it is so uh, important to see the difference between uh, Marx's original manuscript and Engels' edition. When you ask uh, what is, where you can find the crisis theory of Marx, and crisis theory is an important achievement because all the bourgeois economics tell us, oh, crisis is not really a problem, uh, a market system is stable, the neoclassical tell us, the, the pupils of Keynes tell us if the state is doing the correct uh, economic policy, then we can avoid crisis. And only Marx tells us, no, when you have capitalism, you also have crisis because crisis is not a sign of a mistake in, capital, in capitalism. It is a, normal, a sign of normal working of capitalism in some respect. Uh, the, when you reach this aim of profit maximizing, this will in the next period cause a crisis. So crisis theory is an important achievement of Marx. And when you were asked, where can I find crisis theory in capital? Then you must answer, oh, there is nowhere a chapter called crisis theory neither in volume one, neither in volume three. The most extensive treatment of crisis you can find in volume three, in a chapter, chapter number 15, with, which comes after the presentation of this famous law of the tendency of the profit rate to fall, with the title the development of the contradictions of this law. And therefore, many readers of Capital had the idea that Marx's crisis theory is a direct consequence of this law of the falling profit rate. This is a very widespread opinion since 100 years. But when you now compare Marx's manuscript and Engels' edition, then you can learn that most uh, titles of chapters in volume three are not from Marx, they are formulated by Engels. Also this, the development of the contradictions, is from Engels, it is not from Marx. Marx, in this third part, developed his arguments for the tendency of the profit rate to fall. And at the end of this section, he had some remarks about crisis. It was not very systematic. It is very often in Marx that at the end of such a section, he just notes, he makes some notes for further treatment. Engels took these notes he reordered the material, he shortened, he reformulated in order that it looks more coherent, more consistent. And so, in a good part, the impression that crisis theory is the result of this law of the profit rate is a product by the addition of angles. In the original manuscript, um, the things look a little bit different. And this had consequences for the debates of um, the 20th century. This law of the falling profit rate was one of the most disputed laws. I, I cannot um, repeat the arguments. The arguments against this law, I think, are rather simple and are rather striking. But a lot of Marxists very fiercely defended this law because they thought without this law we lost, we will lose uh, crisis theory. 
but this is a totally wrong impression. You can give up this law and you, you will have no real loss. And I argued this in, in another paper, by the manuscripts now published in Mega, Marx wrote in the 1870s, I find some indications that Marx himself doubts on this law. And he never mentioned it in, in the 70s, by the way. So it cannot be such an important law. So this is one point where the, um, the difference between Marx's original manuscript and Engels' edition is crucial, crisis theory. But also when we go to the manuscript, to the original manuscript of Marx, and we look to his remarks on crisis theory, we see that crisis theory is incomplete. Crisis theory in volume three, and also in the earlier theories of surplus value, where you can find a big chapter on crisis theory, is very production oriented. The case of banking, of credit, plays no important role there. In the chapter on credit, Marx mentions crisis, but you will not find a systematic exposition. So, this is one of the, the missing points. Crisis theory is rather incomplete in, in Marx. But the manuscript of volume three was written in the year 1864-65. Marx died in the year 1863 and at least until, uh, no, not 63, 83, died in 83, uh, 18 years after finishing the manuscript of volume three and at least until 81, he was very active in research, and he did research about crisis. So his views on crisis developed much more than that what was included in uh, the 65 manuscript. Already in uh, the year 1866, he just finished this manuscript, in uh, Great Britain occurred a new crisis. And Marx was very impressed by this crisis because he stated it has a mainly financial character so that he pressed a half a page in the manuscript for volume one, which appeared in, in 67, at a place where this consideration about the crisis of 66 had nothing to do with the real content, but he wanted to mention this crisis. So you can see by this how important he, he took this crisis. And after um, this, uh, after he, he published volume one, he even filled uh, a notebook with uh, observations on this crisis. By the way, these notebooks are uh, um, investigated here in your university. One of the investigators is uh, on the panel and others are sitting here in, in the audience. Uh, it is a very important work what they do in order to get a better understanding of Marx's crisis theory. When we want to have a better understanding, we cannot restrict to what is written in, in capital, we really have also to make use of the notebooks. So this was one field um, of critique. I told you Marx wanted to have scientific critique, so he shall get what he want. Another kind of critique um, I have to mention regards the fact that Marx didn't complete Capital. He published volume one. He worked in the 70s a lot on volume two. 
He also worked a little bit on, on volume three, but he didn't manage to finish. And now is the question, why he didn't finish? On the one hand, um, he was uh, also a political activist. He was engaged in the first international. He was indeed the head of the first international. And uh, as you probably all know, in the year 1871, we had this important event of the Paris Commune, in which Marx also saw a, a kind of term of a coming society that um, the people of Paris very spontaneously uh, developed new forms of organization, of uh, regulating their urban uh, society in which Marx also saw um, a kind of model for a coming communist uh, society and he wrote his famous book uh, Civil War in France about this. So by all this political um, activity of course, he, um, he couldn't use all his time for, for capital. And the other fact very often mentioned that Marx in the 1870s became more and more sick. He had longer periods where he couldn't uh, really work. And when you look uh, to the last photo of Marx of uh, 81, the, it was taken in 81 or 82, when he was around 63 years old, you look in the, in the face of a guy you would estimate 85 or 90. So all the hard life he really had um, was a big burden for his body, for his health, and he died not even reaching the age of uh, 65. But I think these two reasons, um, the political activity of Marx and his bad health, um, were not the main reasons why he didn't finish Capital. In the late 60s, after publication of um, Volume 1, I think he was rather close to finishing Capital. He wrote a big manuscript, a new manuscript, for volume two, now published in, in Mega. He had some conceptual um, designs, new designs for volume three. And it looked like that in two, three, four years, maybe he could finish. The 70s, for him, were a completely different period of work. He totally widened his scope. He was aware that new developments came, but okay, capitalism has always new developments, but these were decisive new developments which questioned what he wanted to present this ideal average I, I mentioned at the beginning. He was very clear that his approach to crisis was limited. We know this from his, um, from his letters where he discussed such questions. He observed that in the second half of the 1870s a new type of crisis occurred. Before we had rather short crisis, a quick going down and a quick recovery. In the uh, late 1870s, a short, a, a, a slow going down started a stagnation crisis without recovery. And this crisis also had an international character. Currency rates, the policy of national banks played a role for the continuation of this crisis. So he saw that he has to include a lot of new material. Also, his analysis of the credit system, of the banking system, 
he saw as insufficient. In the 60s, his empirical model was the financial system of Great Britain, the city of London. But in the 1870s, he studied very intensively the economy of the United States. And he made the observation that developments which in, in Great Britain centuries or at least decades were needed in the United States, they happen in a few years. And so he decided, as he also announced in, in an interview he gave at the end of the 70s, that for presenting the credit system, the banking system, the empirical model will be the United States. Also, with what he was occupied in the 70s was the landed property in Russia. Why he was so occupied with landed property? Because it had quite different forms and developments from landed property in Western Europe. This means that the emergence of capitalism took very different forms and as it was discussed, for, for example, in his letters to Vera Sasulich in, in the 70s, maybe also the overcoming of capitalism will have new forms in this different uh, uh, social contexts. And there are even more examples. Uh, Marx was occupied in the 70s with technology, with communication technology in which he saw a, a kind of revolution. He, very, um, he paid very much attention to the first experiments with electrical power, which started in, in the early 80s. And at once he said when this can become usual, it will be a, a kind of revolution of the production process. So, to make this long story short, what did Marx in, in the 1870s? He enormously enlarged the scope of research and the material which should be included in capital. And I would say he enlarged this so much that it was not possible to, to manage this for a single person, even with the genius of Marx. He developed, uh, let us say, a research program for an institute with 20, 30 qualified persons who can work 20 years on, on this program. Um, so this, on the one hand, is fascinating what Marx was doing, but for his project it was also destroying because he left us only fragments and it were necessarily fragments. Engels, in his edition, tried to put these fragments together to form a unity from these fragments. And in 20th century, and I, I don't want to criticize Engels, he, he did the best job he could, he could do. But in the discussions of the 20th century, this seemingly unit of capital lead to a lot of dogmatism in, among Marxists. All the main problems are solved. You can read it in capital. And when you have another opinion, then you are either badly informed or stupid or an agent of the uh, bourgeoisie. <laughs> Nothing else. And of course, such a dogmatic uh, uh, approach lead to a lot of defeats, not only political defeats, also to scientific uh, defeats, because it was very clear that not all the problems are solved. Now, with this mega edition, Marx-Engels-Gesamtausgabe, 
I think there is a chance for a new start. This mega edition is a pure scientific edition. It is not a, a, an, an edition of Marxists for Marxists. No, it is a so-called critical edition, uh, like we have critical editions of uh, Hegel, of Leibniz, of Aristotle, taking into account all the texts, all the variants, uh, the delivery of the texts, and so on. But this purely scientific edition has a direct political impact. It allows us to read Marx beyond any dogmatism. It allows us to recognize Marx as a producer of fragments, not of a closed theory of fragments, but of extremely useful, of extremely valuable fragments. And it also shows to us what is our task nowadays. Our task is not just a, a kind of scholastic task to interpret these fragments. Of course, we also have to do this, and I, I did this also in my scientific work. But our task is beyond. Our task is to use these fragments in order to create an up-to-date analysis of capitalism, an up-to-date analysis about the ways how we can leave capitalism, and an up-to-date discussion what means socialism or communism today beyond such authoritarian uh, encounters we had in 20th century. And in so far here, science and critic meets. And maybe we can grasp that this uh, sentence, which I quoted before from the, um, from the preface of Marx, every judgment of scientific critique is welcome, that this sentence is not only an invitation of Marx, no, it is a kind of necessity to make use of Marx. Scientific critique of Marx is necessary in order to make use of Marx today. And with this, I also want to come to the end. Thank you very much for your attention. We are going to open for a few questions. Gostaria de agradecer Michael e Nós temos ainda tempo e vamos abrir a possibilidade de algumas perguntas serem dirigidas ao nosso convidado. Tá. É... Enquanto um fone chega para a tradução poder ser feita, a gente também pode tentar ajudar aqui, com a ajuda do professor Hugo. É, então, os que desejarem fazer a pergunta, eu pediria que levantasse a mão para o microfone poder chegar até vocês e que se identifiquem e dirijam a palavra ao nosso convidado. Professor Domingos Girolete, eu queria cumprimentá-lo pela sua apresentação. E como o Marx tem uma obra, é, não só capital, mas também as obras filosóficas, etc., que são também extremamente importantes, né? É, eu gostaria de saber se nesse trabalho que vocês estão fazendo, vocês estão incluindo essas obras filosóficas e se eventualmente vocês descobriram algum manuscrito extremamente importante e que traz, digamos, uma contribuição que a humanidade ainda não, não conhece. Essa é a primeira questão. 
A segunda, como ele escreveu todas as obras é, na Inglaterra, como é que isso passou para para Alemanha e por que que vocês iniciaram exatamente esse movimento de reunião e de revisão é, das obras de Marx? Obrigado. Mais alguém? Vamos fazer um conjunto de três. É, bom dia a todos. É muito, muito bonita a palestra, gostei muito, muito obrigada. É, nós estamos vivendo tempos muito difíceis aqui no Brasil e enquanto você falava sobre a importância da obra de Marx, eu, eu fiquei pensando em aproveitar a presença do reitor e e que você pudesse nos ajudar a como trazer a obra de Marx para o pensamento na universidade. Existem vários grupos estudando, mas como tornar uma obra de reflexão do dia a dia, já que é tão importante perceber essa importância do capital. E aí eu fiquei pensando... Não, tinha que ser para segundo grau, os alunos de segundo grau. Eu não sei como é que seria na Alemanha segundo grau. Não me lembro aqui. E aí eu pensei, nós estamos vivendo a escola sem partido agora. Onde nenhuma reflexão é possível, mesmo para os jovens, adolescentes. Então eu, eu queria que você nos ajudasse a sair desse, dessa lama que nós estamos, com ideias de como trazer o capital para o dia a dia, como formar recursos humanos, como refletir essa obra, como cidadãos. Não sei se ela não está conseguindo. Eu tenho alguns problemas para entender a translação. Há disturbing noise in, in the transmission. Yeah. It is working, but with a lot of noise. Uh, é, tem como arrumar um outro, um, um outro áudio para ele? Porque pode ser que esse aqui não esteja... Só um yes. minutinho. Melhorou? It's work. It's working now. The second, the second question. The second question, but I, uh, she asked if I can help, and this I didn't understand. Because uh, she, she said, she said that we are living a very difficult period yeah, in Brazil like crisis. How, how, what is your opinion? How can you, what suggestions you could make to bring capital as something that could be teached to students even under they enter university, a secondary school, if that is possible or not. And Ok, terceira pergunta. Alguém? Bom, boa tarde. Aqui. Eu gostaria de pedir se você pudesse desenvolver mais esse aspecto que você diz fundamental do capital, que é de uma crítica epistemológica ao nosso tempo, uma crítica à forma de pensar que resulta do modo de organização da sociedade sob a forma de mercadoria. Né? Acho que foi por aí que você disse. Será que deu para... Yeah, thank you for the interesting questions. Um, 
I will try my best. Um, the first question about the philosophical works. Mm, I think we already have to be cautious with such a distinction, philosophical work, economic work, uh, sociological work. These are nowadays um, uh, distinctions. Um, in Marx's times, it was not so clear, these distinctions. And we also have to see that Marx, in his lifetime, he had a development. The Marx of 1844 is not the same Marx as of 48 or 63 or so on. His first uh, approach was a deeply philosophical approach shaped by the young Hegelians. In German ideology, in, um, written in um, 44 or 45, he came to a very radical critic of philosophy. And after this, uh, I think if you would have named him a philosopher, he would say, oh, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a scientist. And there is a big difference uh, between. Um, so I'm rather skeptical against discussions in the 20th century where it was tried to find dialectical materialism as a philosophical foundation, historical materialism as a theory of history, and then a Marxist political economy. In the whole works of Marx, you never find the term dialectical materialism. Nowhere you find the term historical materialism. This is a kind of systematization which later generations did, but this was not the, the claim of Marx. Even we know from his son of law, Paul Lafargue, that Marx, when, when Paul Lafargue told him about some French uh, Marxists, Marx answered, oh, I am not a Marxist. And this was not just a nice phrase. In his famous uh, Notes on Wagner, written around uh, 79 or 80, Wagner was a German economist um, writing a textbook mentioning Marx and saying, oh, Marx is the founder of the socialist system. Marx comments, I never founded a socialist system. Of course, socialism was his political aim. But that socialism is an, a political aim is something else than to found a socialist system. In so far, I'm rather critical. Marx's work, of course, it has philosophical implications. It has implications for history. But I would criticize a notion like Marxist philosophy, Marxist history of science. These are constructions, artificial constructions, which has not really to do with um, what Marx wanted himself. One text which is seen as a kind of founding text of uh, historical materialism is German ideology. The title is not from Marx, German ideology. It is not a text. It is a collection of approaches written, by the way, not only by Marx and Engels, but also um, by Weidemeyer and influenced by Moses Hess. The addition of um, German ideology since the 30s is a history of the forming of a fairy tale. Now in two months, two or three months, finally uh, the volume of Mega, including these approaches, will appear. And when you will compare what is a 
what will appear in MEGA under the title German ideology, with older editions, you will see it is a big difference. And it is not the founding uh, paper of historical materialism, not at all. So, you, you asked also to, to manuscript with new insights. I think this old text, German ideology, in the new edition, will also present new uh, insights when you realize that it is something different than as it was constructed for uh, nearly um, 80 years now. Um, then, the second question you put, I must say, I, I don't know if I really catch it. You said Marx uh, wrote in England, and why now you collect and, and do all this in Germany? Uh, Marx wrote mainly in German. Capital was written in England, in London, and I would say it was only possible to write it in London because there was the access to the British Library, the biggest library of the world in this time. You had the British Parliament who did a lot of parliamentary investigations which were published. You could nowhere in the world in this time you con could find so much information about capitalism like in London. So capital as we know it could be written only in London. But it was published in German. It was published in a German publishing house. The first English translation of Capital happened after Marx's death in the year uh, 1887. Um, Marx, no matter that he lived in London since the year 49, he showed a very clear German influence. He was, he was coined in, in some respect, not only by Hegelian philosophy, by young Hegelians, he also was coined by um, conflicts, political conflicts in German, by the, the encounter of uh, oppression by the Prussian state and so on. So to, to do this in Germany with mainly German uh, researchers, I think it is not so surprising. Nevertheless, in the meanwhile, MEGA is an international project. For example, also this year uh, appeared a volume about uh, the notebooks on the crisis of 57. These notebooks uh, were edited and published by a German Japanese a group of researchers. We have uh, Japanese researchers, French researchers, British, um, uh, American researchers, and what here is done about um, the, the notebooks of six, uh, to the crisis of 66, it is not the editing, but it is an important preparation for, for the editing. So, meanwhile, um, MEGA is really an, an international uh, project. Um, to bring capital to not only to universities but even to, to secondary schools, this is not at all uh, impossible. Um, maybe it is impossible to bring it to the institution of the school because the schools, I suppose it's similar in, like in Germany, they are state controlled and maybe the state doesn't like that uh, the, the pupils read so much, so much, so much Marx. But um, as also I did in, in my youth, my occupation with Marx uh, started when I was 14 years old. We had political groups in, in the school which reflected uh, the, the groups of the students and with, uh, in the age of 14 I, I started to reach Mar Marx, uh, in the age of uh, 16, 17 I read for the first time volume 1 of Capital, it is possible. What is an, a, a good and necessary tool is f uh, 
introductionary literature. Capital is not so complicated that you can say, oh, I, I don't dare to start. Everybody should dare to start. But it is very rich of arguments, of hints, which in a first reading maybe you overlook. And in so far it is good when you have uh, a little bit a guideline. I wrote such a guideline years ago. It is uh, in, in Germany, it was a big success. It is also now translated in, I don't know, six, eight languages. It can be a help, but nevertheless, I stress in this guideline again and again, it shouldn't be a substitute for your own reading and for your own thinking. It, it can be a, a push, but uh, walking you must uh, do by yourself. And so I think uh, it is possible, even in the age of 15, 16, to, to discuss seriously about uh, capital. The, the, the question is, do you have an institutional form? It would be good to have reading groups which can discuss, which can come together to do such a project, not just uh, individually. The third question about um, the implications of the, um, the epistemological question. Um, Marx, in the 1840s, when he criticized his own uh, philosophical attempts in the 40s, he made a kind of uh, empirist, uh, empiricist turn. In these fragments of German ideology, he criticized philosophy and said, oh, what we want to do is just to state facts and not to, to have these uh, abstract uh, philosophical constructions. In Communist Manifesto, he read in Capitalism, all the illusions of former societies are melting in the air, people are forced to look on reality and to, to recognize reality. So in this period, in, in the last 40s, in the late uh, 1840s, Marx had a very strong empiricist view. We just have to look seriously to reality and to, uh, to recognize what we can see. Only in the 50s he recognized that things are not so easy. And I, I gave uh, the main um, keyword fetishism. Another keyword is mystification. This means that the capitalist reality itself produces a certain view of itself which looks natural, which looks not like a certain view, a certain picture, but which looks just as natural, given for granted. And this is analyzed by Marx with this term, objective thought of form. This analysis of fetishism, it stops not with uh, commodity fetishism in the first chapter. It goes through all three volumes of capital. After commodity fetishism, Marx deals with um, money fetishism, and then in volume three, he deals with capital fetishism. And at the end of the manuscript of um, volume three, there is uh, this famous chapter on the Trinitarian formula. Marx sees a, trini a trinity in economic life that we have three seemingly three factors of production, capital, labor, land, and they are rewarded with profit, uh, wages, and ground rent as a kind of natural conditions of production. And when you go to the economic faculty, probably you will find a lot of textbooks which just start with this 
viewed, saying, okay, every production today and in the past needs capital, labor and land, and these three factors receive profit, uh, wages and landed property. No. Wrong. These factors are as factors, a social construction. What you need for production are means of production, instruments, machines, raw material. You need living labor, but not necessary wage labor. And you need land, but not landed property. So the material factors of production are confused with the special social form of these, um, these factors. And this confusion is not a manipulation by, by someone, it is an impression spontaneously produced by capitalist conditions. And this has epistemological consequences. How can we recognize this reality? We have to overcome we have to, to go through this fetishism and mystification. But this fetishism is not just a, a wrong view. It is a kind of naturally produced view which will exist until capitalism, as, as long as capitalism is existing. And this puts new question to, to uh, in, in new problems to the um, uh, to the question, how I can recognize this old philosophical question, how knowledge is possible, how recognition is possible, is put in a new light when you consider what Marx analyzed as fetishism and, um, and mystification. I hope I could give some, some hints. Vou fazer mais uma rodada para nós caminharmos, considerando o adiantado da hora. É, eu vejo, já te vejo que há várias pessoas interessadas em fazer pergunta. Nós não, infelizmente, não vamos ter como, como acomodar todos, mas o nosso convidado vai permanecer aqui ainda por mais um tempo e as outras pessoas que desejarem fazer uma pergunta posso, podem fazer isso depois, tá? Fazer mais uma redada. Onde está o microfone? Vamos lá. É, boa tarde. É, em primeiro lugar, agradecer a palestra. E o que eu queria perguntar, é, partindo das preocupações que, é, como você mesmo colocou, eram também preocupações do Marx, que eram de partir das, dos estudos, das análises que ele tinha sobre a economia, sobre a sociedade. É, e pensar também como transformá-la, né? É, eu queria saber é, como você avalia e, e quanto você conhece é, as obras do Lenin e do Trotsky como é, as partes que, obviamente, assim, são muito conhecidos como grandes políticos, etc., mas também as partes que eles é, desenvolveram sobre economia e sobre, é, sobre as questões de como funciona a economia capitalista. Porque uma das preocupações que, que quando você colocou, é, que foram do próprio Marx, quando ele vê a, a predominância do sistema financeiro, por exemplo, numa das crises na Inglaterra, é uma, é uma das coisas que o Lenin desenvolve num livro que se chama Imperialismo, Fase Superior do Capitalismo, que ele coloca da monopolização e do novo papel dos bancos, é, que isso levou a uma análise de... É, de prever a, a Primeira Guerra Mundial como uma guerra de partilha do mundo entre as grandes potências, etc. É, e também a outra, uma outra é, teoria do, do Leon Trotsky, que é a teoria do desenvolvimento desigual e combinado, é, que, de alguma forma, também é, marxistas brasileiros também tomaram isso de alguma forma, como o Caio Prado Júnior, que eu não conheço tão bem é, a obra, mas que procurou analisar as formas atrasadas, como você colocou que o Marx é, estava preocupado, por exemplo, com a, o tipo de propriedade de terra na Rússia, é, ou, ou mesmo coisas que a gente viveu é, e vive na América Latina, que são é, expressões de uma sociedade é, atrasada, como baixíssima produtividade no campo, etc., com polos de capitalismo extremamente desenvolvido. Eu queria saber 
É, como você vê isso também, é, essas teorias, como se você considera importante, etc., no momento que os questionamentos ao sistema capitalista é, também começam a aparecer cada vez mais à tona com, com toda essa crise que, é, que se vive mundialmente, que inclusive o próprio Brasil está vivendo, como formas de também buscar... É, ter fios de continu continuidade desde a obra do Marx até a situação que a gente está hoje. Ok. O próximo. Uh, bom dia. Obrigado pela palestra. Meu nome é Giovanni, sou de economia. É, você tinha comentado uma parte da sua palestra sobre a questão dos capítulos 3, 14 e 15, se eu não me engano, do livro 3 do Capital, no qual o Marx fala sobre a tendência da queda da taxa de juros e como isso levou a uma série de desdobramentos que deixou a coisa meio confusa e foi um espaço para a teoria marxista sofrer muitos ataques. É, e você tinha comentado que se acreditava, de uma forma geral, que é, essa seria a base da teoria de crises, da, de, da crise do Marx. É, isso não é exatamente verdade, é bem mais complicado que isso. É, mas, dado que essa não seria a explicação para a teoria da crise de Marx, o que você acha que formaria, dado que você conhece os manuscritos e tudo que o Marx estava desenvolvendo e não chegou a terminar, é, o que você considera, você acha que poderia formar uma teoria da crise em Marx? O que, o que a gente poderia usar de Marx para fazer uma teoria marxista da crise? Mais um, por favor. Olá, boa tarde. né? É, muito obrigado pela palestra, em primeiro lugar. É, eu gostaria de aproveitar o gancho na questão que o senhor falou no final sobre o fetichismo. É, para comentar uma palestra que eu vi no, no YouTube sua, né, em que o senhor começa a falar sobre a questão da neutralidade do Estado capitalista né, e de como é, essa neutralidade ela serve ao mesmo tempo como uma, face, uma forma de legitimação, né, que você tira a questão da dependência pessoal. Né, então, atribui-se uma impessoalidade né, dentro desse sistema político e econômico e como que é, essa aparente neutralidade, aliás, essa neutralidade de fato, essa neutralidade institucional de leis, de direitos, ela é, se acaba perpetuando a dominação de classe. Né? É, e aí, logo depois, o senhor fala sobre a questão dos movimentos sociais e tal, como que a maior parte dos esquerdistas, dos movimentos sociais de esquerda, eles estão fazendo é, coro, coro a, essa, essa, a essa continuidade do Estado capitalista, apostando em, em digamos, pautas que né, não são de ruptura exatamente. Eu queria saber a, a posição do senhor em relação a isso. Né? Isso tem acontecido no mundo inteiro. Né? A questão da, dos movimentos revolucionários hoje são bastante minoritários. Né? E se... É, o senhor acha que isso deveria ser superado? Ou quais seriam as formas de a gente chegar a uma via de fato para viabilizar a revolução? E a outra coisa, uma coisa bem breve, que eu queria saber, quando é que a gente vai poder ter acesso à primeira edição do MEGA, aí, que é um grande trabalho que vocês estão fazendo, e que eu tenho muito interesse em poder ler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, difficult questions. <laughs> um, especially the last one, which, which um, refers to um, a YouTube uh, you see with a lesson from me, but nobody else or uh, the others didn't see. So it is um, 
difficult. Maybe we should this uh, talk about this privately. It was a, um, a lecture I gave about state and, and so on. So in order to, to say something to, to this, I have to repeat a lot, which is not uh, possible. Um, the other question you put about uh, the mega, uh, you have um, what already uh, appeared of mega, you have it here in the library. Um, but the principle of mega publishing is to publish everything in the original language, in the language Marx and Engels wrote. So when they wrote in German, it is published in German. When they wrote in uh, English or in French, it is published in English or French. So the main part is in, in German. I think there is no Portuguese part, but there, is, there are some excerpts in Spanish. Marx uh, wrote articles about Spanish uh, revolution. He used Spanish literature. He knew a little bit Spanish and he did his excerpts in, in Spanish. Finished, as I told, this was not a joke uh, when I said maybe in 20 years it is ready. Um, it was a very optimistic estimation. Probably it will last more than, than 20 years. Okay, um, the question about uh, Lenin and Trotsky. Mm, also, this is a, a complicated question um, because it, it needs much more to, to explain. Um, when I understood correctly, you mentioned Lenin's um, book on imperialism theory, that there is already an, an analysis of financial capital and um, as, as a part of, of imperialism. I must say I'm rather skeptical about this analysis. Um, it is not rested on Marx, it is rested on Hobson, of an uh, English radical. Uh, and Lenin didn't hide this. He, he mentions Hobson as his uh, main source. And when you compare Hobson, when you read Hobson, and unfortunately, most uh, pupils of Lenin doesn't read Hobson, they read only Lenin, but when you read the book of Hobson, which appeared already in the year 1902, then you will see that in, you will find in Lenin no analytical uh, proposition which not already was in Hobson. The financial capital, uh, uneven development, the workers' aristocracy, all this you find in Hobson. But Hobson was not resting on Marx, he rested on this so-called radical school in, um, in, in Great Britain at the end of 19th century. So the, the contribution of Lenin, I would say, is a little, a little bit outside what Marx intended to analyze, and I think it cannot fit in, in the gaps we, we see by Marx. It is uh, something else. With Trotsky, uh, I think the, the case is maybe even more complicated, but I must admit that I am not so deep in um, occupied with, with Trotsky, with Lenin and Hobson. I wrote a study of a, a comparison, so I, I can be uh, tell you rather strictly my, my opinion with Trotsky. I would be a little bit more uh, cautious just because I, I don't want to pretend something, to pretend uh, a judgment which I, I cannot give. The, the question which is left, which was the second question about um, profit rate fall and uh, crisis theory. Um, when I understood correctly, uh, you wanted to hear from me on which elements uh, a modern crisis theory can um, attach. Here, I think, you find on the one hand 
uh, a very important core of crisis theory that Marx can show that capitalist crisis is not at all an accident, that crisis is the result that something went wrong. This is the view as well of the neoclassical school. They say, oh, we have too less markets, too much state regulation, and this provokes crisis. And it is also the view of uh, the Keynes uh, uh, pupils who say we have too much market, we have too less state regulation. If the state would do a nice economic policy, we could avoid crisis. And Marx argues that crisis is the necessary outcome of the process of profit maximization, because what happens in profit maximization, on the one hand, you try to extend the production, to develop productivity, so you increase the, the commodities, and on the other hand, the consumption of the commodities is restricted. The capitalists try to uh, restrict the wages, they try to restrict the number of workers, and also their investments, which is also a big part of consumption, consumption is not only individual consumption, is uh, restricted by the um, expectation of coming profits. So what Marx also states in, in this, what Engels to, uh, made chapter 15 out, that the, the law of production and the laws of consumption are totally different in capitalism, but both belong to each other. And they, they fall apart the more the profit maximizing um, aim is reached. In so far, the crisis is a consequence of uh, the success of capital. When capital has success in, in profit maximizing, crisis is the outcome in the future. And this is an, uh, an idea clearly developed in Marx, very distinguished from any other economist. But it's only the basic idea. The way Marx uh, developed this idea is restricted to a production system. But in capitalism, we always have a combination of production and credit. This, in some respect, can be found uh, even in volume two of Capital, where the capitalist circulation and reproduction is investigated. Capitalist reproduction is not possible when you don't have a credit system. Credit and banking is not a kind of appendix, something additional. No, it belongs to the core of capitalism. No capitalist production without capitalist credit system. But this combination that the crisis theory has not only to rest in uh, the theory of capitalist production, but also in the theory of capitalist credit, this was not fully developed by Marx. We, find, we can find some hints, some approaches, but it is not fully development. And therefore, we need to develop this. But in order to, de to develop this, we need a full developed uh, theory of credit. And this we also don't have in Marx, we only have hints. So, this would my view what you need for for developing uh, a crisis theory of um, which is up to date um, for today. Bom, considerando que já cumprimos, digamos, a maior parte da nossa agenda, eu vou caminhar para encerrar então a nossa conferência. Queria mais uma vez agradecer a presença de todos, é, novamente a professora Paula, diretora da FACE, por não só prestigiar-nos, mas também nos ceder o espaço. And would like to thank you, 
Michael, on behalf of uh, UFMG, for coming and sharing with us not only the, your critical view on Mark's work, but of course your expertise and your knowledge. Thank you very much on behalf of the university. We are closing the session. Thank you.